Welcome everybody. I'm Paul Pepis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. I want to welcome you to this online edition of our Books in Print Talks, an ongoing series hosted by the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Books in Print Talks are presented by UO faculty authors who have recently published books that were supported by an Oregon Humanities Center Research Fellowship and or an Oregon Humanities Center subvention grant to help cover publication costs. If you have questions for our presenter at the end of the talk, please use the chat feature of Zoom. You can access that feature by hovering over the bottom of the Zoom window with your cursor. The questions will be moderated by me and I will ask them. This talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. We've also enabled the live transcript function of Zoom. If you click on that button at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can, uh, uh, it will create a live transcript of our conversation today. Before I introduce our speaker, I just have to alert you to an exciting matching gift opportunity. Supporters of the OHC can maximize the impact of the gifts that you make, thanks to the generosity of Amanda and Alex Haugland, supporters of the Humanities Center, and they are generously offering to match gifts made to the OHC through the end of this year, December 31st, 2020. You can give to the OHC by going to ohc.uoregon.edu slash give. I'm delighted now to introduce our speaker, Elizabeth Wheeler, newly promoted professor of English and Disability Studies at the University of Oregon. Betsy will talk to us about her recently published book, Handy Land, The Crippest Place on Earth, which came out uh, from the University of Michigan Press in 2019 and was supported both by an OHC Research Fellowship and an OHC Publication Subvention Grant. Betsy teaches and researches in the fields of disability studies, young adult and children's literature, comic studies, post-1945 US literature and popular culture, and community-based education. She is the founding director of the University of Oregon's Disability Studies minor, housed in the English department, as well as the director of the University of Oregon's Literacy Initiative, an engaged learning program based in the English department which pairs academic courses with internships at local schools and nonprofit agencies. Welcome, Betsy. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to hearing about Handyland. Hello, it's great to be here with all of you. I'm going to start with a whole bunch of thank yous. First of all, thanks to our host, Oregon Humanity Center, especially Paul Pepys, Melissa Gustafson and Peg Gerhardt, with whom I've worked most closely. The Oregon Humanities Center has been a creative partner through every phase of this book. Uh, the OHC Faculty Research Fellowship gave me the time and the seclusion to write the first chapter and the fellowship and the works in progress talk at the end of the fellowship really gave me the vision uh, for the book as a whole, and really for all the future of my scholarship. And then finally, an OHC subvention grant paid for the permissions for the illustrations and some of the photos in the book. Second, my love and heartfelt thanks to the young people with disabilities and their families who have given me not only their friendship and support, but also the interviews and conversations that have been so fundamental to shaping my thoughts in this book. So thank you so much to Cindy Finnerty, Jamison Bowman, Karina Cooper, Diana Lee, and the Christu, Elliot Jones, and Morell families. And finally, to my own family, Jordan Shin, my wife, who took many of the beautiful photographs in this book, and also to our offspring, Kevin Shinwheeler and Bird Shinwheeler. So, Handyland, The Crippest Place on Earth. What is it about? This book is about children and teenagers with disabilities in literature for young readers and in real life. In the era since new disability rights laws not only in the US with the Americans with Disabilities Act 
and with the Individuals uh, with, with Disabilities Education Act, but around the world, since these new rights laws have allowed young people to move into public space much more. And the book is also about how they and their families deal with continuing barriers that can range from people staring to broken elevators to having to fight, fight very hard for minimum types of access and accommodation. The book starts uh, from real life with stories from real life about some of the spaces of early childhood, the playground, the preschool and the public restroom. And it uses these stories to identify concepts necessary to understand what happens when a disability goes public. I then take these concepts and apply them to young adult and children's books that depict characters with disabilities moving into four kinds of public space, uh, nature, school, fantasy and fandom, and finally the adult world of sexuality. So what is Handyland? I'm going to start reading from the book to give you that definition. Throughout this book, I use a fictional place called Handyland as a yardstick to measure how far we've come toward justice and how far we still need to go. What would a fair world look like for children with disabilities and their families? My friend Cindy and I used to ponder this question a lot when our boys were young. Her son Jameson and my son Kevin were born a month apart and they both have cerebral palsy. We met when the boys were about a year and a half old. In Cindy, I found a friend who had the same frustrations and same daydreams about a world without barriers and stigmas. As she said once, we formed a deep bond because we realized that our kids were perfect just the way they are. Our conversations led us to reflect more broadly on the social roles childhood disability plays and the kinds of support our kids would have in a perfect world. We call that ideal world Handyland, which is a play both on handicapped and on the children's game Candyland. Cindy tells Handyland's origin story, and this is a quote from one of our interviews. Quote, we were talking about how wonderful it would be to live in a community where all the houses are accessible. All the houses fronts face a park-like setting. Everybody had ramps. It was all flat, accessible. There was a community building in the middle that would be a full physical therapy gym and a resource library for families maybe a pool, whatever you could envision to help our children be happy and succeed. It's just out the front door and everybody's homes are accessible for everybody else's children. I was telling my friend Emily about this dream, about this community where nobody would judge each other, all families would know one another, everybody would be capable of having their other children just pop in for a hello, just like it should be. And she said, you could call it Handyland end quote. We could add many things to Handyland. Every child gets invited to birthday parties. We all know sign language. You can have a meltdown in the middle of the community center and nobody blinks an eye. The computer room gives, gives everyone access to screen reading and voice to text software. There's a free 24 hour insulin bank, equipment repair center and counseling service. According to Cindy, however, it boils down to two basic principles. Families who accept their children from the start and support systems that let families know their child is perfect. And in this book, I call that kind of support system a prosthetic community, which I define as a cluster of living beings, objects, resources, technologies, and ideas that enable full inclusion. And in fact, I came up with that idea of the prosthetic community in that OHC works in progress talk. The prosthetic community characterizes a society that works well for the disabled people in it. While we might think about prosthetics as inanimate technologies like a leg brace, for instance, 
They can't work without people and money. Throughout this book, I highlight the wide variety of wraparound supports young people with disabilities need to become full citizens of their societies. Goodwill and good intentions can't do the job alone. It takes decently paid caregivers, consistent advocacy, good health insurance, input from disability communities, and lots and lots of creative brainstorming. This book traces the extraordinary things young people with disabilities can do if their prosthetic community supports them well. It also details the devastating and even fatal consequences of withholding prosthetic community from young people. Now, I'd like to spend the, the rest of my book reading time reading to you from the last chapter of the book, which takes place very far away from Handyland in urban sacrifice zones. And this chapter illustrates another concept, intersectionality, which comes from the legal and critical race scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw. And it means thinking about how minority identities, for instance, race and disability or race and gender, how they interact with each other. When we consider two or more aspects of identity together, problems and solutions swim into view that were previously out of sight. For instance, we can see that Black Lives Matter and police brutality are disability rights issues. We can see that environmental issues are completely intertwined with race and disability. I'll warn you that this chapter presents some very grim realities. As I said, we are definitely very far away from handy land here. This chapter is called Runoff. In neighborhoods across the United States, African-American children have disabilities because lead has poisoned the water in their taps and the paint on their walls. There is absolutely nothing wrong with having a disability. However, people in power do wrong when they create disabilities, then deny communities the means to care for themselves. Afrofuturist science fiction bears witness to such injustice and makes the risks of environmental illness real and tangible. Sherry L. Smith's 2013 young adult dystopia, Orleans, imagines a bloodborne illness in the New Orleans of 2056 after multiple massive hurricanes. When the Delta fever threatens to spread outside the Gulf region, the federal government declares it no longer part of the United States, cuts off all services, and erects a heavily policed quarantine wall. To survive in this abandoned society returning to swampy nature, people hunt and fish, barter and battle, form themselves into tribes based on blood type, and try to relieve the fever's pain by stealing cleaner blood. Fen de la Guerre, the teenage main character of Orleans, carries the disease, but her O positive blood type gives her some protection. She braves toxic and debilitating waters to secure a better life for the next generation. The novel follows her adventures as she evades blood hunters and tries to save an O positive newborn baby she calls baby girl from contracting the fever. Eventually they meet the scientist Daniel who sneaks into Orleans with, from the outer states with hopes of curing the Delta fever and joins them in their quest. And today I'm gonna to talk about two concepts that I draw from this novel and I'm going to apply them to real life. One of the main things I do in this book is really interweave uh, fiction and real life. These two concepts are the toxic economy and runoff. These metaphors unveil the surreal logic of environmental racism 
and the acts of imagination necessary to oppose it. They face down the contemporary politics of environmental illness for African-American youth in urban landscapes of sacrifice across the United States. Orleans holds up a mirror to the life of Freddie Gray, who had learning and physical disabilities from childhood led exposure. For Gray, Fen de la Guerre, and many other young people of color with environmental illness, disability has served as a primary trigger of state surveillance and harm. Exposure to toxic runoff leads to running off from the police. The toxic economy. A toxic landscape becomes a toxic economy. People survive by harming themselves and others. This economy depends on the circulation of water, blood, and chemicals, but also the liquidity of capital, the circulation of money. Clean blood is the principal commodity in the toxic economy of Orleans. With its stark portrait of economic exploitation, Orleans, like other science fiction, can help us overcome the obstacles to our full understanding of capital's role in environmental crisis. Blood hunters assess and threaten the bodies of Fen de la Guerre and baby girl according to the market value of their O positive blood type. And this is a quote from Fen de la Guerre. The novel alternates between speaking in her voice and in a third person voice. The fever be in us, but it ain't eating O blood up from the inside like it do other types. So O types got to be extra careful of hunters and the blood farms where they be taking their kidnapped victims to drain them alive, end quote. Blood hunters would love to capture a prize like baby girl. As Fenn states, quote, baby girl brand new, cleanest blood there is. She ain't got the fever in her yet and won't if I be careful. Don't give her Orleans water or cuts to taint her blood. Baby girl puts the future in Afrofuturism. She has a chance to survive. The toxic economy of Sandtown, the Baltimore neighborhood home to Freddie Gray, depends on the flow of capital and the circulation of water, lead, paint, and blood. These two kinds of liquidity cycle together, create disability, and turn young black bodies into countable commodities. Ruth Ann Norton is the executive director of the Coalition to End Childhood Lead Poisoning. In 1993, when Freddie Gray was a child, Norton would walk down the streets of Sandtown and quote, parents could tell me their kids lead level right off the bat before they could tell me the name of their child's school or their teacher, end quote. Out of medical necessity, the children's blood had become quantifiable data. The numbers for environmental risk correlate with both race and poverty. Sandtown is 97% black, the legacy of racial segregation and then after segregation, uh, when the steel mills closed down, uh, Sandtown became a kind of place that went from home ownership to slumlording and anybody who could get out did get out. Saul Kerpelman, a Baltimore attorney who has represented clients in more than 4,000 lead poisoning lawsuits over three decades says that nearly 100% of my clients were black. That's the sad fact to life in the ghetto that the only living conditions people can afford will likely poison their kids." End quote. Lack of decent affordable housing creates a quarantine wall like the one in Orleans, no less real for being invisible, trapping families within the lead poisoning zone and subjecting them to the toxic economy of slumlording. Blood hunters track Fen and baby girl because their O positive blood type has a high market value. In Sandtown, blood lead levels and Maryland judiciary lawsuit case files track the grisly economics of slumlording and environmental racism. Sandtown residents live off the toxic economy 
through the drug trade and the lead checks they receive from lawsuits. Non-residents profit from the toxic economy of Sandtown through slumlording, predatory finance, legal fees, policing, and electoral politics. Freddie Gray's family won a lead exposure settlement from their landlord, Stanley Rochkind, in 2008. But Rochkind's investment in substandard housing extended far beyond the Gray's apartment building. Between 2001 and 15, the state of Maryland uh, Department of Environmental Quality reached a lead abate, uh, uh, I'm sorry, hundreds of tenants sued him for lead paint exposure. And in 2001, the state reached a lead abatement settlement regarding 1,250 rental properties with 87 different entities in which he had a controlling interest. Predatory finance companies also profit from lead poisoning. Access funding, for instance, visits young people with lead-derived cognitive impairments in their Baltimore homes and offers to, offers to buy their structured settlements for cents on the dollar. Freddie Gray sold $146,000 of his settlement for $18,300. In Orleans, blood hunters co-opt medical tools from care into exploitation, stealing the blood of children. In Sandtown, finance companies co-opt lead checks from redress into exploitation, preying upon young adults with intellectual disabilities. In Freddie Gray's Baltimore, police promotions and electoral politics depend on collecting and counting black bodies. David Simon, former Baltimore Sun reporter and author of The Wire and The Corner, says that Baltimore police officers quote, rounding up bodies for street dealing, drug possession, loitering, and such. The easiest and most self-evident arrests a cop can make is nonetheless the path to enlightenment and promotion and some additional pay. Police and politicians hunt stats for their own professional advancement, and African-American bodies supply the numbers. In a few decades, Sandtown went from the old Jim Crow of residential segregation to the new Jim Crow of mass incarceration. The war on drugs of the 80s and 90s opened the door to arrests without probable cause. Then Martin O'Malley, Baltimore mayor from 1999 to 2007, rewarded police solely a number of arrests, seeking good crime statistics to bolster his ambitions for higher political office. And you may remember he was a presidential candidate at one point. Neil Franklin, a former Baltimore police officer says, quote, and in these searches, we were stopping and searching anyone who might look like they fit the bill of a drug user. Officers did whatever they had to do to lock up as many people as they could to satisfy police headquarters, end quote. Often for petty crimes or no crimes at all, Arrests reach a high of 100,000 in a single year, and the excessive policing continues. Like the blood farm in Orleans, Sandtown serves as a profitable holding tank for black bodies. In landscapes of environmental sacrifice, runoff leads to running off from troops or police. Unchecked pollutions cause disabilities and the state responds with quarantine and excessive policing instead of a prosthetic community. Orleans police state reflects the African-American millennial generation's painful understanding of law enforcement since the war on drugs. The Anti-Drug Abuse Acts of 86 and 88 and the 1994 crime bill much discussed in the current presidential debates led to people of color's mass incarceration for drug offenses. Not only individuals, but entire zones find themselves under such control, which replaces care and prevention for young people with disabilities. Escape seems the only healthy option. At the conclusion of Orleans, Fen de la Guerre braves the armed troops on the quarantine wall to help baby girl escape from Delta fever. 
First running and then wading toward the guards through waist high muddy water. Fen creates a distraction so Daniel can smuggle baby girl into the outer states through a crack in the wall. As the spotlights converge on Fen and ignore Daniel, he uses his immunity to save a young life. Fen cradles a bundled up coat as if it were an infant, believing the soldiers won't shoot a woman carrying a baby. She is wrong. Quote, her arms were raised, her face turned up, the bundle held high in the air. She rotated in a slow circle as the rain washed the mud from her skin. For an instant, she looked at Daniel, the moment hung in the air. Fen's mouth curving into a smile, seeing him and the baby almost there, almost there, that is, through the, through the wall. She turned away. A shot rang out. The bundle fell from her hands. This moment seals the pact between runoff and running off from state violence. Polluted Delta water covers Fen as the rain falls and she splashes through the mud. The slow violence of toxic water leads to sudden death from a gun. Fen succumbs, but in service to her ideals. She releases baby girl into the care of an unknown but safer realm in the outer states of America. While an act of heroism, Fen's death also embodies a toxic economy in which care of others requires hurting oneself. Fen's vulnerability to violence and disease underlies her heroism as much as her courage and strength. She matters in her totality. And so does Freddie Gray. Gray found, also found that runoff led to running off from police. Right before his last arrest, quote, and this is uh, D. Watkins, who is also from Poor Black Baltimore and has written an autobiography. So D. Watkins writes, he ran like a lot of black men do when we see cops, because for our generation, police officers have been the most consistent terrorists in our neighborhoods. Almost every black person I know from a poor neighborhood can give you a collection of nightmare stories about the Baltimore City Police Department, end quote. Under the best of circumstances, it is difficult for young adults with intellectual disabilities to make the transition from school to work. In Sandtown, it is nearly impossible. For young people with impairments from lead poisoning, the missing safety net includes education, job supports, and service plans tailored to their needs. Ruth Ann Norton reports that, quote, a child who was poisoned with lead is seven times more likely to drop out of school and six times more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system. The criminal justice system steps in as the only sorry substitute for disability services. For Freddie Gray, the slow violence of environmental illness culminated in the sudden violence of police brutality. He died at the hands of Baltimore police after his April 12, 2015 arrest for running unprovoked. As officers folded him awkwardly into the back of a police van, his legs seemed injured. The officers drove Gray around without a seatbelt, making four stops while ignoring his pleas for medical attention. When they arrived at the police station half an hour later, Gray could not breathe. He died a week later from an 80% severed spine. All the officers were acquitted of wrongdoing in the case. The criminal justice system harmed him, then denied him the means of care, operating in the same ethical void as the environmental racism that caused his disabilities in the first place. Throughout this book, I've used the term prosthetic community to describe the cluster of people, money, education, and job supports necessary to secure a decent future for young adults with disabilities. In Orleans, Fenn and Daniel serve as a prosthetic community who furnish the technologies of survival baby girl needs. With a strong prosthetic community in place, it might have been possible for Freddie Gray to live a long fulfilling life instead of dying in police custody at 25. 
In the absence of a prosthetic community, the Baltimore police stepped in as a sorry substitute. Poverty, injustice, and reading comprehension issues go hand in hand like white cops and innocent verdicts, writes D. Watkins. Freddie Gray is one of many men and women of color with disabilities killed by US police in recent years. Um, in a Ruderman Family Foundation study found that disabled individuals make up a third to a half of all people killed by law enforcement officers and disability, uh, people with disabilities make up the majority of those killed in use of force cases that attract widespread attention. Disability and police brutality go hand in hand. By all accounts, Freddie Gray lived off his lead checks, family help, and his own small part in the toxic economy of drug dealing. His lawyer, Creston Smith said, in Freddie's case, there were some learning issues. He had some learning disabilities from lead paint exposure. He didn't read or write perfectly, and that causes a person to seek economic independence other ways, end quote. What was Freddie Gray doing when he could have been learning to read, write, and master a trade? He was running away from the police. As a sophomore, he went to a Department of Juvenile Services facility and never returned to special education at his regular high school. Gray's time in juvie gives him something in common with many other Sandtown kids, as well as African-American students with disabilities across the country. A quarter of Sandtown children between the ages of 10 and 17 have spent time in a juvenile facility. There isn't much else to do besides getting arrested. There is no swimming pool, no recreation center, and no police athletic league. Across the United States, young African-Americans with disabilities find themselves in the pipeline from special education to prison. In fact, there is a profound racial dimension regarding the youth with disabilities who wind up incarcerated. Ultimately, compared to white students with disabilities, black students with disabilities are four times as likely to be educated in a correctional facility. We could see the justice system as kind of a scattershot version of Orleans, confining young black women and women with disabilities. Caught in the Baltimore Police Department cycle of catch and release, Gray was a defendant in 23 cases between the ages of 18 and 25. We know this, his juvenile record is sealed, so we don't know about how many cases there. As Nicolas Medina Mora reports, quote, most of the criminal cases brought against Gray did not result in a conviction. Court records show that Gray was arrested over and over again for everything from possessing drugs to playing dice in a public housing development where he didn't live. Over and over again, records show his family and friends accrued debts with bail agents to keep him out of jail. Over and over again, overworked prosecutors dropped all charges. Gray spent most of his 23rd year in jail without being charged. His family devoted their time and at least $29,000 to bailing him out, money they could have used for helping him enter the world of work. The only job training Gray received was behind bars. Washington Post reporter Terrence McCoy writes, in jail, he learned brick masonry and harbored ambitions of getting into the trade. But even that seemed a stretch to some. Said psychologist Neil Hoffman, who interviewed Gray as part of the lead poisoning lawsuit, quote, I don't know much about brick masonry because I am not very handy myself, but you know, is he someone I that I would want to plan my walkway? No, end quote. Freddie Gray had a future, just as Sandtown has a future, despite its toxic economy. We do not know what Freddie Gray's life could have been if he had experienced a strong prosthetic community instead of excessive policing. The toxic consequences of lead paint and runoff gave way to the toxic consequences of running off from the police. His death helped inspire the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, staking a claim to a better future. 
we could look at all the things that happened to Fende Laguerre and Freddie Gray and think that their lives were cursed, but that's not true. With the right supports, they both could have lived long and fulfilling lives as disabled people. Young people with disabilities deserve full lives. They deserve so much more than the minimum they often get. Handyland is meant to provide a vision of what young people with disabilities real progress towards independence and full membership in society would look like and serve as a yardstick to measure the social realities that fall short. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy, so much for telling us about your fantastic book, Handy Land, The Crippest Place on Earth. I would invite uh, members of our audience now to use the chat function of Zoom to type in questions that I will share with Betsy so that she can answer. While we're waiting for others to add their questions, Betsy, I, I can begin. First of all, um, tell us a little bit about the, the style or the form of the book. You've already mentioned that it combines fiction and reality. It also seems to me to combine techniques from literary uh, criticism or literary study and other kinds of yeah. um, academic fields. Would mm -hmm. you say a little bit about the form? Yeah, it relies on interview research, as I mentioned, and really a lot of the concepts from the book come from those interviews uh, of actual families of kids with disabilities. Um, and it also relies on, on factual research that I was going into urban studies and urban planning in this chapter and in other, and I was looking at different kinds of, of, of uh, environmental pollution. And let's see, what else did I look at? I look a lot at educational outcomes for young people with disabilities. Uh, what happens in that transition from school to adulthood? Uh, what happens with discipline uh, in school. Uh, so I was looking at educational, particularly disability studies in education. And I also ventured quite a bit into different kinds of theories. So I used a lot of critical race theory. Um, I used a lot of queer studies. Uh, and, and obviously the whole book relies upon the scholarly field of disability studies for its basic concepts. On top of that, um, in one of the chapters, I'm looking a lot at uh, a field of philosophy called animal studies, where there's been a lot of controversy about where there is, a, I argue, a kind of systematic disrespect in using uh, kids with disabilities as their example that there could be some uh, non-human animals whose lives are worth more than a person with a disability. Uh, so I come back at that pretty hard. There's also a lot of visual material in the book. I'm looking at picture books, I'm looking at graphic novels. So I'm looking at some of those tools for doing um, analysis of pictures together with words. So you, you say that you drew on uh, certain concepts from the academic field of disability studies. Since you're the founding director of the disability studies minor at the University of Oregon, would you tell us a little bit about that field? It's a, a yeah, relatively sure. new field. And tell us a little bit about what's important about it and what are the hallmarks of its approaches? Disability studies started to get well known about 25 years ago when some of the foundational texts in the field came out. And one of the fundamental premises is called the social model. And it's usually contrasted to the medical model or what's sometimes called the individual model. The social model argues that, and which is very much at the heart of what I talked about today, that um, there's nothing wrong with having a disability if the society accommodates you, if society is rebuilt so that it isn't so tough to make your way through these barriers. Um, and, and the field was founded largely by people with disabilities, by scholars with disabilities. And there's a real um, privileging of thinking about disability from the point of view of the person who experiences it, 
Whereas previously, this is one of the big differences between disability studies and other fields that came before it, is that whereas in, um, in education, you're coming at it from the point of view of the teacher, or the administrator, how are they intervening with kids with particular disabilities in the classroom? How are you educating them? Uh, or the point of view of medicine, where you're thinking about how you're gonna treat this person, how you're gonna cure this person. Uh, in disability studies, you're really looking at it from the point of view of individuals and disability communities. And along with that goes an idea that people, with, people in a particular disability community have their own culture that uh, we have our own kind of folkways and terminology and ways of moving through the world. We have our particular kinds of ingenuities and understanding. One of them that the psychologist Carol Gill has looked at is that there tend to be among people with disabilities a, and communities, a higher tolerance, a higher understanding that things go wrong, that you may have to have a plan B worked out. Um, and that tend to go like, well, okay, can't get together today. That's just how it is. Uh, so actually, um, I was at the Society for Disability Studies conference in the spring. We were all talking about, in some ways, we were more pre prepared for the pandemic than other people were. Uh, and underlying all of this is a basic sense of the dignity and worth of people with disabilities. Can you say a little bit more about your... Uh point that you just made that uh, the disability community was better prepared for COVID. And you might say something about how COVID has impacted uh, disabled people. Let's see, where will I start on that one? Um, well, one of the things that people talked about, I, I heard this really great talk um, by uh, Leah, I cannot say her name properly, but I'm going to try it. Leah Samarishina, where she was saying uh, because of her chronic illnesses, she's been asking for years uh, when people ask her to do talks to do it via Zoom. And they'd all say, well, we don't have the technology for that. And suddenly when the mainstream needs to not be around each other, suddenly Zoom is really easy. So she was already really good at Zoom. So some of these technological devices people have learned how to use. So that's one of the things that might be a little easier. I think also um, the sense of fear and risk, something that I noticed in myself uh, is that some of the other parents around me or just people around me were much more freaked out than I was at first about the fear of catching COVID. And I realized it was because I have parented two kids who have potentially deadly food allergies. And so that was kind of a presupposition of our parenting that if we weren't gonna like go crazy and lock our kids in a bubble, that we were gonna to have to learn how to take the appropriate scientifically approved precautions and then let them go and just not obsess about it. Just, just do what you gotta do and then move on with your life. So those are a couple ways uh, in which those things are at work. Um, in terms of ways that it's impacted different uh, disability communities, um, my thought goes immediately to nursing homes that we've certainly seen the disproportionate effects on people in nursing homes. And of course, strangely for nowadays, that includes a lot of young people as well as old people I was reading in the paper and I was quite amazed. It was only like a month ago that there, that um, New Jersey was saying that, that uh, parents who have children in nursing homes could interact directly with their kids. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's awful. So there's that. And certainly we see the increases in housing instability and homelessness and such a large share of people in poverty and people who become homeless have disabilities. So that's a couple of kinds of effects that we're seeing. Would you say something about the relationship of scholarship and activism in your work? 
Yes. My work certainly, I like to think, I may be deceiving myself, but I like to think that it's a feedback loop and it's easier for me to see, I won't really call it activism because it's not exactly activism, um, but I teach a class every other year that includes um, uh, students from University of Oregon, half University of Oregon students, and I'm giving a shout out to a couple of my co-conspirators on this project. It's a theater class, and the other half of the students are adults in the community with disabilities and many of them have intellectual and developmental disabilities and they come together, tell each other stories and we turn it into a play. And I have certainly learned a lot from the community students in that theater group about their tremendous creativity and insight, some of the difficulties they've encountered in the jump from school to the adult world that has very much informed my thinking in the book. It has allowed me to get to know people uh, with intellectual disabilities and the autism spectrum, which were not, uh, I didn't know a lot of people with those disabilities. So it's just given me a certain familiarity that I think has gone into how I think about things. And it's diversified the types of disability that I can talk about. Um, I think a lot of my passion for this subject grows out of advocacy that I have done, and I guess I would see that as activism for U of O students with disabilities in trying to help them brainstorm about how to overcome these sometimes utterly ridiculous barriers that they face, just preposterous barriers. Um, and so uh, it has only increased my sense of the absurdity of bureaucracy. Um, and so all that is really fundamental and being a parent and being part of the disability community. Um, and in terms of how it feeds back into my activism, I certainly have had the opportunity to read a lot of stuff for this book, to read a lot of research of all different kinds, to read a lot of stories, to collect stories. And I feel that that knowledge base, it gives me facts that I can share with people. For instance, um, I, you often don't hear uh, about the disability backgrounds of so many of the people who have been killed by police brutality. And that's something that research has really led me to understand and uh, that I hope makes me, you know, a, a better ally and a better community partner. And actually the, the I'm, I'm actually working right now in a Zoom reading group where we're interrogating whiteness and there was a chapter on the school to prison pipeline. And that was something where, and, and these are not academics in the group with me. And I felt that I could talk a little bit about what that is and, and how it works because of my research. So we're coming <clears throat> to the end of our time. I again want to encourage anyone from our audience who has a question for Professor Wheeler to just type it into the chat function and I will share it. I can ask another question, which um, is, um, you've already mentioned a couple of things, but are there any other things that you learned while you were doing this book that were particularly striking or memorable for you? Oh, wow. I learned so much, let me think. Just tell us one. Okay. Uh, and everything is flying out of my mind. Um, one of the things that I learned, this is a fun thing. Um, is that I really started exploring uh, 19th century literature as well. And it turns out that there is this fantastic tradition of disability representations in 19th century, in the 19th century. I mean, disability is just all over 
uh, literature for kids in the 19th century. Right now I'm actually reading L. Frank Baum's pseudonymous books for girls and boys, and it's just all over the place. But what's interesting is that in most of the realistic stories, like say Heidi would be an example, or Secret Garden for an early 20th century example, the kid gets cured, right? And, and that's the only way that he's gonna, he or she's gonna be able to live a happy life. But when you go into fantasy, they get to keep their disabilities. They get to be like the king of the kingdom and like little Aiden Prince where he's got this like magical assistive device that's this magic carpet that he can fly on. And, uh, and I also found out that, uh, that Lewis Carroll had a stutter and that he composed the, these great kind of satirical poems uh, for his brothers and sisters, he had like, I don't know, some math, he had like 11 brothers and sisters, and most of them stuttered. And he wrote this like really funny, this really funny poetry, making fun of people telling you sort of, just get over your stutter. You know, it's not a problem. You should not, you should stop stuttering. And so I have this whole chapter where I'm talking about how you can see in Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass, this kind of, the way that he has this absurd satire about adults telling you to just sort of fit yourself into some impossible little box. Uh, and I talk about the way it kind of grows out of his own disabilities. So we have a question. If you could write an additional chapter now, mm -hmm. what would it be about? I am writing some stuff right now that continues off from it. One is I'm going further into Afrofuturist science fiction. I'm writing about the author Nello Hopkinson. Uh, her stuff is just so deeply intersectional. And what's really great about it is that it's really fun. And I think that one of the things I would like to do as a companion to the Orleans chapter is just talk about Black Joy Matters. And uh, another thing that I would have liked to do more of is to have more comics in the book. And I'm working on something uh, right now about the Joker in Batman, about, about the Joker and mental illness. Can you say a little bit about, uh, you've tw a couple of times referred to Afrofuturism. You wanna say, tell yeah. our audience what that is exactly when we use that term in literary mm -hmm. studies, what we're talking about? Yeah. Afrofuturism isn't just in literature, it is in music, it's in film, it's in fashion, uh, visual art, it's all over the place. And it's practiced by people, not just in the US or North America, but in Africa and the Caribbean all over the place. And it's basically imagining a future that includes black people. And it's silly that that should be something that people have to claim or assert at all. But so much of science fiction is very white. There's been a lot of pushback um, of black authors, um, against black authors winning the big sci-fi prizes. And so it's really just arguing for the inclusion of black characters in the future and, and just imagining the amazing futures there could be. And also the idea of like maybe sometimes as Sun Ra used to say, space is the place for the human race. Like, like maybe we just need to get the hell out of the here and now. Okay, Betsy, thank you so much for that fascinating talk about your new book, Handy Land, The Crippus Place on Earth. I want to thank all of our audience for joining us. Um, for more information about the Oregon Humanities Center, the events that we sponsor, the programs that we facilitate, you can go to uh, ohc.uoregon.edu. And if you'd like to give to support the Oregon Humanities Center, go to ohc.uoregon.edu slash give. Thanks again for joining us for this book and print talk presented by the Humanities Center on uh, Professor Betsy Wheeler's book, Handyland, The Crippest Place on Earth. Have a lovely day.